Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by Carium, the telehealth platform enabling healthcare's digital transformation, helping you care for people within the fabric of their daily lives. Now, here's your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Matt Parker, Senior Vice President of Product at Kairos and HealthSpark. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Nice to be here. So what I always like to do before getting into the main part of the conversation is give my guests more of a chance to give a background in terms of who they are and what they do. So Matt, the floor is yours. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I get to um, I get to serve as a leader of our product organization here at Kairos and HealthSpark. Um, I've been in the the healthcare transparency space for um, for almost 20 years. I, I, I've been at HealthSpark for, for the last five or four, four and a half or so. And um, I came into it on the RX side. I um, started a company with, uh, with a friend of mine back in Chicago uh, about 20 years ago, focusing on RX price transparency and kind of developed that over time, worked with Medicare on the Part D, um, the Part D plan finder and, and some of the work that was done to, to roll out cost transparency there for the Medicare population. We commercialized a lot of that work. And, and then I came over to HealthSpark to, to kind of more broadly talk about medical cost transparency for, for users and really help find ways to use the, the technology that we have around transparency and directories, not as a checking the box of mandates, but actually helping guide people to care. I think we do this not because we have to, but because we want people to really figure out how to find the right care at the right time under their insurance plan. Um, and and so we really focus on bridging the gap between, you know, a, a pretty compelling user experience to help people make sense of all the kind of craziness of what their options are um, within that sort of regulated space of, of mandates. You know, it's very interesting to hear that you've been kind of around transparency for, I think you said about 20 years now. Yeah. Um, but before we kind of start unpacking what what is actually going on with price transparency at the moment, I'm curious, what first got you into healthcare? So I uh, I went to law school in Chicago and had every intention of practicing. Um, my wife and I got married right as I was ending my my law school time, and both of us wanted to move to California. And I was too lazy to take the bar twice. Um, and I had a friend who was starting a a tech company, sort of at in the boom uh, back in the the original internet boom. And I decided to kind of teach myself how to do technology stuff. To, to, to tread water for a couple of years before we moved out to California. And then I'd go and take the bar and do all that after getting rich on, 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 on the inter, on the internet.com bubble. Uh, of course, best laid plans. None of that happened. And I actually fell in love with, uh, I fell in love with technology. I really, I really like, I really like solving problems, figuring out ways, um, ways to change the way people interact with uh, organizations like insurance companies or health plans or providers. And, and it's kind of never looked back. Yeah, no, I hear you. I'm not wanting to take another bar. I I graduated law school a year before my wife started residency, and I was sweating yeah. bullets uh, about having to potentially switch states and take a take the bar a year after having passed it. That's uh, right. So I was like, Illinois, okay, I, I can do the Illinois bar, and then have to go have to go and then do the California bar right after that. I was like, That's too much. I'm going to just wait. I can wait a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, no, luckily I was able to stay in Massachusetts, so I didn't have to retake yeah. the bar or find a sec- find a job a year after the economy tanked either. So it was right. uh, a double benefit there. But you know, you, you're saying about falling in love with different areas and loving complexity, kind of focusing on price transparency yeah. must have tested both of those loves. Uh, because even with kind of the recent push to enhance transparency, it doesn't yeah. seem like it's gotten too much better. So, you know, and, and also given what you were saying a minute ago, having been around it for an extended period, can you just kind of like lay the groundwork for where where we've been over the past you know 20 years that you've been around it you know kind of and and give that progression to where we kind of where we stand now so i'm a pretty strong believer in the 80 20 rule and um i think that's that sort of informs my view of how to build products right part of the problem with healthcare price transparency in general is the complexity but most of that complexity or a lot of that complexity exists in the edge cases and so i think the way the way the products that I've worked on over the years have really focused on solving the problem is is sort of trying to take out and start with the things that aren't as complex. So I started with RX 
transparency, it's, it's significantly simpler. I mean, it's not, it, you know, it's not easy by any means, but it's a lot simpler than sort of medical costs and medical plan designs. And, you know, really starting with the, the, with the low hanging fruit and saying, Hey, look, I've got, for most people, a uh, prescription for this drug is going to cost X. This is what their copay is. That's going to solve a lot of the problems because if I need to go and figure out what, well, what is my infusion going to cost? And that's covered under my, my, uh, you know, that's covered under my medical benefit, not my RX benefit. There's a lot of complexity there. Let, let people who can talk through the options handle those things and, and save time from having to answer questions like, oh, how much is a prescription of Lipitor going to cost? That's an easy question to answer. And so I've sort of, that's how I've always sort of focused on this, which is let's take this piece by piece. Let's iterate and build on top of things. And each, each cycle is going to get better and more complex and, and, and be able to handle more complexity. But we learn from how do users read and understand this information? How does it inform their decision making? Yes, a lot of this stuff is mandated, which means you've got to put the information out there. But unless an end user is actually using it to make decisions, you know, just throwing numbers on the wall, it doesn't, it doesn't really help. So I think you've got the, the best way to the best way to influence users more effectively is to do that iterative approach. Um, and so over the last 20 years, we've built up more and more and more um, ways to display this information. It's not perfect. Um, the edge cases are, you know, those are the horror stories, right? The people that go to the hospital and think they're getting a, you know, a quick checkup and it ends up costing them $150,000 because the anesthesiologist is out of network. I mean, those are real horror stories and I'm not trying to minimize the problems that, that exist within our system for that. But those are also exceptions. And so being able to focus on how do we put our time and attention on fixing those problems by, by letting us, let, let's use self-service, let's use technology and tools to solve the bulk of the interactions with their users. That's sort of been the way I've, I've been trying to, to influence our product evolution over the years. And that approach definitely seems intuitive. So I think, as you just said, if you can ease the path on the vast majority of interactions, then it better enables attention to be focused upon the kind of, you know, as you said, the, the extreme examples or the, the edge examples where the complexity increases and become, and really requires more untangling. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I think it's, you know, the mandates, you know, this, this current cycle of mandates, um, I think that the, the silver lining of, of them is the amount of data that is being requested and, and being um, well demanded that it be public um, is going to allow more folks to be able to go in, look at that information, and try to build experiences that can innovate on on new ways of expressing this complex information. It's very difficult. We're in the we're in the throes of implementation with all the payers that we work with, and so I know right now with our heads down on these, it, it doesn't feel like a silver lining. We really see in the cloud for the most part. Um, but I think the reality the reality is that once this data is out there and available, you'll start to see a flood of innovation that sits on top of it that says, hey, how do we make this better experience for users? What can we do to, what can we do with, now that we have your price data out there, what can we do? I, I, I remember when, when we did this with Part D, when Part D first came into play and all the health plans had to pr- put out their, their RX pricing information, there was a lot of concern about what this would do, what kind of steerage. And I remember in the first couple of years, we saw that tool users who are engaging with Medicare Part D or the commercial versions of the plan finder applications were actually making smart choices. They were picking one of the top three plans. They tended to find plans that were lower cost from a total cost of ownership because they could make that part of their decision. Not everyone did that. Some people still picked on traditional buying choices like brand or, or, or recommendations. But compared to those who were going through agents or brokers and not looking at costs, there really was a steerage impact. Like people were choosing lower cost plans. And, and again, we're not trying to, I don't think we're, this isn't, this isn't a big bang. We're not trying to fix all of healthcare in one fell swoop. Um, but these small little changes really do add up and, and make a big difference. Yeah, so kind of breaking that apart a little bit, you know, as you said, there's new mandates, you know, whether we're talking about the hospitals who have li- been living under the mandate for a year or the payers who are starting to come into it. You know, what are the data that, are being exposed and you know what is is that the right data or should different should it be a mandate in a different form in terms of you know what should be made available yeah so so this year um the first sort of the first wave for the payer for the payer mandates in particular which is what we spend a lot of our time on 
The payer mandates are, are, are really a three, there's kind of a three-year phasing. This year is focused on releasing uh, what they call the machine-readable files. So these are really just data dumps of, of negotiated rates um, and out-of-network, historical out-of-network payment um, his, uh, data um, around services at uh, items and services of care at the provider level, right? So Dr. Smith does this procedure, and this is what we have contracted with Dr. Smith to pay for that procedure. And that, that, that's the first, the first wave. Um, that takes effect um, on 7-1. It was a 1-1-23 requirement, but the departments are using their discretion to, to, to hold off on enforcement until July 1st. So essentially a, you know, a six-month extension for, for that first wave. Then starting on 1-1-23, that data should be consumed and displayed to members in a self-serve digital tool via phone and via paper readout, which will then really get into the overlap of what would be an out-of-pocket estimate. So for Dr. Smith, for that service, not what is the negotiated rate, but what are you going to pay for that service under your plan with that insurance company, with, um, with where you are in your deductible and other accumulator status. So really getting into getting in front of an individual with what they need to know about those costs. And that's a limited subset of services like the hospitals. I think hospitals have about 300 services that they have to show in their tools. The health plans are going to have 500 services or some overlap between the three and five um, on the payer side. And then in year three, the third wave, um, a health plan member should be able to look up the cost of any item or service that any provider uh, within their network. So expanding that 500 choppable services to sort of all services that you could get um, under that plan. So that's sort of the three waves that we're that we're working towards um, for the current set of mandates. And kind of given, as you said, that it's you know coming out in waves, and each wave builds upon the prior one to you know kind of expand the data that's available, as well yep. as making it easier for individuals to navigate through it. Mm-hmm. Is there any concern about you know fr- frustration from the individual perspective of well, I thought this all this information is supposed to be available because you know. As we usually see when there's broad media coverage, it, nuance kind of gets thrown out the window and it just right. says there's transparency. But when you actually pull it apart, you realize that, you know, as you just helped explain, yeah, there's transparency, but it's going to come in stages. Because I think if you did try to throw all of that together at once, you'd either have massive noncompliance or you'd have a fight against the regulations of saying this is too much to have to do. You know, so kind of given your experience, how do you think you can fight against or help better inform and educate the general person who's looking for the information about why it's good that it's you know being rolled out in an incremental manner? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the fa- the phase one data, it, which comes out really in, in July, is not really meant for an end user, right? It's, it's um, you know, these are data sets of raw information, sort of like the first phase of the hospital rules where you were just putting out rate sheets. An end user would, would not really be able to understand or consume it. And these files are, are, you know, hundreds of gigabytes large. Like these are, these are really meant to be consumed by machines and, and repurposed and, and have applications built against them, either from an analytics standpoint or, or uh, you know, I, I can imagine app developers who are sort of chomping at the bit to be able to say, Dr. Smith is going to charge this much for Aetna and this much for United and this much for Humana. The real wave that'll impact members will be that first wave, that second wave, which is the one one twenty three date. And I think what you'll see there is a pretty useful tool. I actually think it will be fairly useful. You're going to be able to search for common services and see copays um, and your cost and your coinsurance on what your what your out of pocket is going to look like. I would say one thing: most health plans already have that tool in place, right? So, so there are very few health plans left that don't have some sort of price transparency. HealthSpark, we power, you know, we power seventy or so health plans today. Um, with that very tool, right? So we we I mean, we've been doing this for for almost a decade um, at HealthSpark, uh, where we power that tool for health plans. So some of the challenge is is not about whether or not you're displaying transparency to members and giving them the option to go and find out what care is going to cost before they get it. It's actually letting members know that they have access to these these applications. I would love to be at a problem um, at the beginning of next year in which members are clamoring to find out price transparency information um, because that would that would le- that would suggest that folks are actually starting to think about what their care options are and how to better make choices about that um, when, when they need care uh, from the system because today 
most members don't engage with the tools that are available. Some of that can be because the tool has limited data available, but some of that is, I don't know that I can even, I don't know that this is an option, right? If I need to go get care, did I even know that I could find out what it's going to cost um, beforehand? So I like the way the phasing is happening. I think we're not going to have to wait long before real people can log into their insurance portals and get real good information. And that last point that you made about informing individuals about the availability, I agree, is going to be very important. And for those of you just joining, I'm talking with Matt Parker from Kairos and HealthSpark. We've been talking about price transparency and the kind of rolling out of new requirements. And I, I would like to dig a little bit more into that last piece around you know, helping to inform individuals. Do you, th- you know, kind of based on your Part D experience that you were talking about from before and saying that you saw people actually taking advantage of what could be there, you know, do you have any thoughts in terms of what can be done to help better inform individuals about the, the availability of these tools? So I think there's a lot of folks that have a role in that. So the health plans themselves need to need to think about how to how to market engage their members more effectively. Uh, we work with a number of our plans uh, with incentive programs, for example, that um, that uh, allow for shared essentially a shared savings framework for patients or for members of those plans to be able to to shop for care, find cost effective or high quality care and, and be incentivized for, for that activity. That, that's one way to do it. I think traditional, you know, sort of traditional marketing communication programs um, are, are needed. I think employers, um, you know, most people get their insurance through their employer. I think having employers um, as they roll out their, co- their coverage, being able to talk about these, being able to engage with, you know, your HR, a lot of people, when they're first thing, I need to get, I need to get care. They, they start with their HR department, right? Or they start with their friends on Facebook or they go to Google, whatever, but they're, you know, where does somebody start in making sure that all those places where people are starting this, the, the journey of finding care, that they know that these options are available. Uh, we do know though, that when we look at our, on the Kairos side of our house, on our, on our provider side, that uh, a fairly significant number of appointments that get booked online actually start with the health plan. So the health plan space itself is a place people are going to find care when they do it. And so um, we're seeing that transition over time. We know we know that as these tools are available, as people talk about price transparency, the good news of the mandates, um, frankly, is, is you've got more people talking about, hey, the health plans have to do this. That's You trigger that kind of thing. Well, I'll go to my health plan and find it. So I'm, um, I'm hopeful. Uh, that over time people will begin to see this, but it's hard because it's a behavior change. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if you've ever needed care. <laughs> Your first thought isn't, oh, what's it going to cost? How do I go to my health plan site to figure it out? I think that's setting those expectations and getting people to think about that as part of their care evaluation and care selection process is is really what's needed. Yeah, and I guess would it also be fair to say that you know, kind of an extension of you know that process that you're describing is you know, to not be throwing up barriers to that process either. Because it's, you know, I live in Massachusetts, so we've actually had a price transparency requirement for a number of years now. Right. And, you know, I remember a few years ago, I had an elective procedure coming up and more just out of curiosity and to see if the process would work. Mm-hmm. I tried to obtain the pricing information and it was not easy. One problem was probably I was cha- I was about to change health plan, so I was going to be on a different health plan when the procedure happened. So I tried calling the new insurer. They said, "Well, we can't talk to you until you actually have our coverage." Right. And then called the provider because under the mass law, both sides have to disclose. The provider said, "Oh no, you have to call the insurer for that information." Right. And you know, at that point in time, I ended up getting my information, but that was because I represented the provider. Uh, because I was in private practice, so they were my client, and I knew they had a billing a, a billing operation. So I called her, and she I could feel the head shake over the phone. Going, they should know this. They should be answering the question. They shouldn't have given you the runaround. No, I I, I think it's a great point, and I think it's I think it's true that I, I think it's true that the ability to get this information is not always easy. Frankly, I do think the mandates are going to help that. I think it's pretty clearly setting up expectations on what you get from a provider, what you get from a payer, how to do that. I do think the mandates are going to, you know, a provider is going to tell you, you know, provider is going to be able to tell you, um, here's what you you need to go to your health plan to find this. Here's how you log in. I think the use case that you're describing of 
a person between coverage or in the middle of coverage, that's that's a difficult to solve problem because all of this stuff is behind a login. And if you don't have an account yet, you're not gonna be able to get in there. So that's a that's a true technical problem. Hopefully that that doesn't happen um, too often. Um, and there are some, you know, there are some ways that Georgia, for example, is actually requiring in addition to the transparency and coverage that you can go on and log in as a prospective member and see what your cost would be if you were covered. And so there may be some ways um, that that as we continue to expand the technological solutions we're putting in place, that we can actually begin to to kind of get in front of that enrollment point. But yeah, it's that it's it's the 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 how to get the information is difficult. I don't want to overly complexify it because I do think this isn't as hard as it as it needs to be in all cases. I do think that what you get is there's a there's a literacy problem too, right? So once you get into the tool, you know what. You know, am I getting an MRI with contrast or without contrast? Or am I, you know, am I getting, you know, I'm doing a knee surgery and does, are you including facility fees in the bill? Like, so there's, there's a lot of components of understanding that I, that I consider to be part of our job, right? As a technology solutions provider to say, we have to build a user experience that removes that complexity and helps people understand sort of what the bottom line costs are and, and little pride of ownership. But I think we've done a pretty good job with that in our tool. And, and as we start rolling, as we start rolling this, th- these new things out next year, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping to hear if you're using one of our plans that you don't have that experience. No, and I think that's a great point that you were just touching on of, of the literacy aspect, because it's, you know, th- that was another piece that, you know, of the experience I had with mass law, which was, I think I needed the CPT code, which, you know, right. I happen to be in a good position of knowing that right. and also knowing a way to look it up, although that's becoming even harder and harder because I think yeah. those are getting locked down even more than they used to be. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, I think, as you just said, though, mm-hmm. the plans and the the vendors who are supporting that are proactively thinking about those issues and trying to bake in improvements to literacy or enablements to literacy sound like they're the ones that will do a better job at, at succeeding and engendering better engagement with their with their members or just you know generally with the healthcare industry. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think that's true. I, I know certainly from a product perspective, um, I f- I like to put the user experience and sort of the design and in, in, uh, considerations actually in front of the technology, right? So. How does a user engage with this? What are they needing? What kind of information? We talk a lot um, at HealthSpark about guidance, right? So we're guiding people to care. We're not steering them anywhere. We're not um, we're not telling them where to go. What we're doing is we're guiding them to the right information. And, and that starts with knowing what you're looking for. What kind of problem are you there to solve? These are very traditional user experience questions. This is not unique to healthcare. You know, any any, uh, you know, any well-designed application is going to start with what problem are you there to solve, what information you need to solve it, and how do you present the information in a way that's actionable and, and understandable. That's true here. That's true if you're shopping for, you know, anything. Um, and, I, and I think we focus on, we focus on sort of that problem. I think what's unique is people don't really want to get healthcare, right? You're not shopping for healthcare. You're getting it because you have to. You're sick or you're injured or you need, you know, you're the family member needs care. So you don't really want to be there in the first place. And the system is unnecessarily jargony, right? And so you talk about CPT codes. You know, we've we've had CPT searching in our application for years. We never really wanted to do it, but we've got call center people at our health plans who are looking stuff up. And so I think one of the things that we focused, what one of the ways we have focused on it is building a taxonomy and building an interface that kind of meets a user where they are and where their knowledge is. So if you search for I busted my knee, you're going to get the same answer as somebody who goes in and searches for arthroscopic knee surgery. We're able to kind of think through how to do that. And I think that's that's really the the job of the solutions providers and the health plans in putting this transparency information out there is to remember that, yes, Mm -hmm. I have things that I have to do to meet the mandate, but at the same time, this is being done for the benefit of one of my members and they don't know all that stuff. So how do you help them through that process. Yeah, I like that approach to it of, you know, not just trying to check the compliance box, but actually looking how you can take advantage of and view the mandate as an opportunity to create a better outcome or a better experience uh, overall. But, you know, believe it or not, we're already almost out of time. So oh gosh. <laughs> I, want to po- I want to pose a final question to you of, you know, kind of what's your bold prediction for the direction and impact that 
these price transparency efforts are going to have over the coming year or coming years? I think what's going to happen, um, I, 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 this is maybe as much of a hope as it is a prediction, but I, but I really do believe that once this data is out there in standardized ways, I think some of the sort of institutional protections that, that payers and providers have put on this information um, in, a, in a way that collaborates for the benefits for the benefit of members and patients um, is going to kind of fall away, right? So once the data is out there, once I've done all the hard lifting um, to make it so that I can tell you what something is going to cost, I'm going to feel less constrained to actually tell you that information in a meaningful way at the right point in time in the care journey. So I actually see the uh, kind of a future in which this does my provider need to tell me to go to my insurance company? I actually see the opportunity for a provider to say, well, let me log into my portal for you and tell you what your insurance company is going to tell you, right? So to be able to have wherever you're going to find this information out, to be able to access it, um, because sort of the data has been freed and the barriers that make it hard to answer those questions are kind of out of necessity have been kind of pushed aside. Yeah, no, I, I hope we do get there as well. Um, but as I said, believe it or not, we are already out of time. Wow. I want to thank my guest, Matt Parker, for a great conversation today. Thanks, Matt. This was, this was really, really nice. Appreciate it. And thank you to everyone listening. Keep the dialogue going. Connect with me at hashtag H-C-D-E-J-U-R-E. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time.